all 40. <laughs> we did it, guys. <laughs> that was one of the most intense moments of my life. But hold on, let's take a closer look at what actually happened. All 40. This wasn't magic, there were no tricks, and there were no secrets. I am going to show you every detail I can about what it took for me to make that sort of power with this engine and this turbocharger. I wanna point out some very important factors in this dyno session. One, this is not a ported motor. Two, these are not lightened rotors. In, in essence, this is a stock two rotor, and I'll break down why I say it that way. For the sake of tuning, it really is. When I looked at how to tune this car, this almost behaved exactly the same. Minus the fact that it looks crazy, it really operates very similarly. One of the points I've argued for a long time, and it doesn't look that way, is that a race car is actually simpler to tune or simpler to work on than a stock production vehicle. And I will argue that again, because this is actually pretty simple. Turbo, cooling down the turbo charge air, going in, fuel, air, ignition, boom, exhaust, back to the turbo, out. Each of those pieces are so critical to making tuning easy. This is that massive Garrett intercooler. It is absolutely massive and it's meant for the amount of power I'm making. That becomes a huge factor when you look at back pressure, when you look at the performance of this motor. For those of you guys that are newer to tuning or newer to just cars in general, this isn't rotary specific, but a turbo has two halves, a turbine, and a compressor. When you talk about exhaust side or exhaust housing, it's this side. And when you shrink and grow the size of this as I did in my last dyno video, that changes the lag of the turbo. But honestly, lag is also a big part of what size compressor. You can have as small of an exhaust as you want and all of that air rushing through it is going through those blades at a very aggressive angle. But this massive four inch or 106 millimeter compressor wheel still takes a lot of energy to spin up and to produce usable boost. Of course, it's always trying to work, but you have an equity here and that's truly turbo lag. This file right here is the dyno run that produced 1240 horsepower. You can see here, I start out neutral, go to first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, finally shift into fifth gear. And I hold it there while I Pray to dear God that I don't get myself killed. And then right here, you can see with this yellow line, we'll zoom in a little bit. That yellow line, as it goes up, is my pedal. Me pushing down on the pedal and then kissing my ass goodbye. You see the pedal go up, I hold on to it until the very last second, where then I kind of hesitate, let go, and it kind of maybe stay into it because I'm not sure. It's a very fraction of a second thing, and then I let the pedal go completely. What you see is exactly what you hear. This white line here is my air to fuel ratio, or lambda in this case. So you see, uh, I'm doing good, doing good, good, and then you hear it choke because it goes lean, because it's got so much air, as soon as that throttle body opens, it goes extremely lean. That's, that's a separate issue, we don't need to worry about that one. But then you see it drops down, and as I'm producing boost, as I'm loading up the turbo, you see that it goes along and it stays underneath the green line, which is my target goal. That's my target amount of what the white line should be. And without much further detail, you can see the white line continues to drop off at the top end, really diverging from where it should be. That's because I'd never been there before, and that's why we made so much power, and yet we still had so much more fuel. In this case, 0.78 lambda, when our goal was 0.82 lambda. And even then, uh, arguably, it was still rich. So tons more fuel could have been taken out, and I would have made more power at that moment. What is very important is this red line right here. This is a telltale sign of the difference between before and after all of the changes I made to the car. This red line is calculated volumetric efficiency. How efficient is the car at that moment? And this is a telltale sign of how efficient your intercooler, your turbo, your engine, how well they are all mated together. It's relative. This is not something that you can use and say, oh, my car's got 130 VE, what does yours have? It doesn't work like that. But what it does is when you compare it to itself, for example, this here is the time that we made 1,000 all-wheel horsepower, which is actually kind of similar. You see some very interesting details show up right here. Look at that weird ass spike and then drop. This is absolutely a result 
of the intercooler, the intercooler loading up and then limiting the engine's ability to breathe. This engine was only at uh, 100 VE, whereas on this, you see it basically continuing to climb. We all thought, looking at the all-wheel drive setup, that, oh my god, there's the end of the stock ports. We all secretly, behind the scenes, were like, okay, well, that's showing that the stock ports on a Mazda rotary engine breathe only to, um, and I think it gets up to, at the last second, about 8,500 RPM. We were very wrong. That tells you some amazing things about this current setup. It is very efficient compared to how it was. This is the peak of my fuel pressure, not differential fuel pressure. Differential fuel pressure is this yellow line right here. If you look at fuel pressure rising, which is this green line in the middle, as well as boost rising, which is this white line up here, they should go one to one. That's what the whole point of the fuel pressure regulator. But something weird happens right here, and I need to dig into this further, and you can actually see the fuel pressure just completely drop off. So it's like we're running out of fuel, which isn't the case. Or the thing that I'm hypothesizing right now is that the fuel tank isn't depressurizing fast enough, and so it's basically pulling a vacuum, causing the pumps to starve. So they drop considerably, and then my differential fuel pressure drops. This is why I stopped on that last run. To put the volumetric efficiency into very clear example, this is my fuel map. RPM, so it starts at low RPM at the bottom right, 1,000 RPM or so, all the way up to 9,500 RPM, a negative boost pressure, all the way up to positive boost pressure, up to 36 PSI. You see is this beautiful curve I started creating, which you'll see made real time in the log as we play that back. You see this nice shape up here, and this is actually indicative of the porting. This does tell you a little bit of interesting fact about the porting. We'll get to that more in a second, but Nice, beautiful, predictable curves right there. Let's take a look at the previous one with the other intercooler. <laughs> oh, dear God. It drops off horribly. Now, this, this map isn't cleaned up as much as my previous one. I didn't do this one. This one was more rough in the way it was done, but it was very effective. It obviously made the power perfectly, but you can see that massive shelf drop off right at, a, that ends up being 7,000 RPM. Again, this is telling you more about the car relative to itself. We go back to the other one, and that looks more appropriate to what it should look like. I would, I would suspect, and this is, a, this is my own hypothesis, but I would suspect that this area would grow higher if you had bigger porting. Let's look at this as an equation. This is energy in, and this is energy out. It takes energy, it takes horsepower on this side to drive the shaft and the compressor on this side. On this car ends up being almost 100 horsepower. It's insane how much power it takes to push this compressor wheel. That could be, you know, like on a pro charger, a belt driven or a supercharger, belt driven in a slightly different way, or electric, it could be electric motor. The point is, is that there is energy needed to put it into this side. So let's talk about energy efficiency. If this was only 50% efficient, we're doing really simple thermodynamics here, that means that all the energy that's being put into this blade, half of it's being turned into heat, which then makes your intercooler do more work. The intercooler doesn't really care, it's just a bunch of metal, but you've just wasted half of your energy because now it's being bled out back and just, <laughs> it's really just taking this hot air and just blanketing the whole engine with it. So you just wasted 50% of the energy it took from this side. So the more efficient that you can make this turbo, the more you're using the energy that you've scavenged from this side. That is where a compressor map comes in. You can actually see where this compressor is most efficient. And that was something that I was trying to do with the combination of watching how fast the wheel is spinning, as well as measuring the temperature and pressure of all of these parts of the system. You can actually measure the temperature and pressure of the inlet, the outlet, the inlet, and the outlet so that's eight sensors, and you can see the energy usage approximately of a turbocharged system. In a car like this, that's almost necessary because nobody's done it before, there aren't shortcuts. This is the compressor map for the GTX 5544, and I've placed very crudely the dots on the 1240 horsepower dyno run. What you'll see here is these numbers on the right side are all RPM. And that makes sense. Hey, it's 6,000 RPM, 65, 7,000, 75, so on. You see it climbing up this chart. Hey, climbing up means more power. The way a rotary works, if you look at the bottom row down here, corrected airflow, you generally 
This is a very rough number, especially as you get up here. But you take these numbers here. We'll say 100 pounds per minute of air on a rotary is generally 760 horsepower. So you can multiply these numbers by 7.6, and you get roughly the rear wheel horsepower of a rotary engine. For pistons, it's very similar, but you multiply these by 10. That's why when you hear, oh, it's a G35900, they're talking about a G35 that flows about 90 pounds of air. In this case, this is a 106 millimeter massive turbo, and it will flow up to about 240 pounds of air all the way up in this area. You can see that we are up and flirting around in the 220 pound per minute area, which ends up giving me about 1400 horsepower. Of course, drivetrain loss and all these other sort of things, it was slipping at the last second. I'm not applying that it was 1400 horsepower, I'm just saying that these are what the numbers suggest. Let's take a look at what a compressor map is. This is saying, hey, the wheel is spinning at these red speeds. If a turbo is spinning at 60,000 RPM, which is this 5950 right here, that means that your power or your amount of airflow or whatever you want to call it is going to be along this line. It's just the nature of this compressor. So you see this beautiful vagina in the very center. <laughs> and this is really the sweet spot of the turbocharger. That area is where the turbocharger creates the most amount of pressurized airflow with the minimal amount of increase in heat. As you get further away, as you stray further away from God's light, this creates more heat than just usable boost pressure. One way or another, there is energy being put out of this compressor. It's just how efficient is it creating usable pressurized air. I'm all the way down closer in the 65 to 68% range, at least at, at peak area. What you, what you see here is AEM data. It's an awesome program. It's actually very, very thorough, and I'm using it in the most basic sense, but it is capturing all of the data that I have logging to the dash, but it is also grabbing the data right in the center here. These are all of the K-type sensors, or basically just temperature sensors in the exhaust. And what you see here is very fascinating. The heat coming right off of the rotors, whatever that is, six inches, four inches from the exhaust port, you see some very interesting information. You see that, okay, you know, as we're going, rowing through the gears, which is what all of these are right here, first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, you see, okay, 1080, 1040, 1100, 1100. They were pretty close. What I learned with the information here is some amazing insight into how to tune this car even further. You're trying to get to a common number here. And you see earlier in, in the dyno, you saw that they were further apart. I did some adjustments, got them closer, got them closer. And as the dyno runs went on, rotors started taking different positions. So you see on these runs, the white one, rotor one, was cooler than the other rotors. And then later on, rotor two was cooler. Normally that's indication that you have a spark plug issue or something like that, or too much fuel. In my case, it's actually the manifold. At, at different horsepower levels, that intake manifold is prioritizing different rotors because that mass is just rushing in. So you can guess that it is actually going more towards the very rear of the, the rotors. So rotor four ends up being the hottest Every time, even if I adjusted for it, it every time would be the hottest. So you see rotor four is green, and every single run, even though I was adjusting, adding more fuel to adjust for more air mass going to the back, nope, still the hottest. Nope, still the hottest. That is the 1240 run, just for reference as well. And of course, which one's the coolest? Almost every time, rotor one. Every run I would do, Rotor 1 was losing more percentage, more of a ratio of the air. So that air mass was just skipping rotor 1. It was about 6 to 8% uh, at the top. It would take less than the other rotors. Another very fascinating thing is you look at here, TC5. That is out of the exhaust. So this is right outside of the turbocharger. You can see the pull occurring, and they're all doing roughly about 1,500, you know, Obviously, you guys can see the numbers I'm seeing. Just say 1480, 1500. But out of the turbo exhaust housing, you're seeing at a peak of 900. And that is used to calculate, of course, the energy consumed by the turbine wheel. Look at the yellow line. The yellow line is so flat, it looks like it's aggressive here, but that is 109 degrees intake air temp. 
Okay, well, what is it over here? 108.1, and it goes all the way up to, holy crap, 109.7. So we're talking about a degree and a half of change on this run. Look at the white line. The white line is actually the amount of heat going into that front mount intercooler. Look at it. It starts at 140 degrees throughout this whole run, and it ends at 245. So what the intercooler is taking in and then what it is giving out for the, what is this, 146 to 246, that's a 100 degree increase. The air that comes out is only one and a half degrees warmer. There were no favors being done here because look at the outside air temp. It was 103 degrees outside air. And actually when you zoom all the way out, you actually tell the temperature of the day as we were going through each of these runs. Finally, I want to show you exactly what it looked like when I was tuning this car and trying to hold on for dear life, juggling everything. This is a log playback. It allows me on Adaptronic software to play back exactly what occurred during those moments. So we'll actually back up to once I put it into gear and started letting out the clutch. So you see up here, you can see the map is moving along so the car is revving. <laughs> So you hear what's going on. I also want to show you on the right side, we got voltage. We've got my pedal. I'm holding in about 15% pedal. My oil temps are 134. Pressure is decent for where I'm at. I would like a little bit more pressure. And my fuel pressure, though, is doing fine. Intake air temps, as we saw earlier, is 108 degrees. Water is 147 in this case. Back pressure is really low, and wastegate is not running at this moment. You can see my primary injectors which are both 1,000 cc's. They're both running at about 8% at this moment. My secondary ones are not. These four injectors here are listed, 1, 5, 9, and 13. Those are all for rotor 1. So those are those four that are just for rotor 1. And this last one right here is a total usage of fuel overall, cc per minute. We'll go ahead, we're going to shift right now to fifth gear. And here I am, just make sure everything works fine. I'm going to go ahead and this case and turn the map on like this. Hold an RPM, hold an RPM, and then press the button. And wow, you get to see how quickly that goes out of control at this very last second. These are two PSI increases, so 28, 30, 32. At the very last second, it does seem to go out of control. Let's back that up and review each of those last maybe five or six moments and see what the hell happened. I'm at 6,900 RPM, <laughs> nice. And I've now hit a considerable amount of boost. I'm at 21 PSI. Uh, and then you'll notice Lambda, you know, my air to fuel ratio is in fact dropping. So I, I'm putting too much fuel into there, uh, which is not a problem. We're not, we're not gonna cause like a rich misfire or anything like that. But look at this, injector one, is at almost 80%, two is at 100%, three is at 30%. So I'm now digging into my big boys. And as we continue going up, it, the car realizes, um, yeah, I'm going to need even more. And then it kicks on the last row. We're about 8,900 RPM. And boom, you see right at the peak, you see that last injector turn on. So this is um, absolutely insane. This is when the car shifts to the side and... Um, this is really where the end of the dyno runs at. So it does hit 30 PSI briefly, but again, we're at 0.78, super rich for my target Lambda, not even close to it. And uh, at 30 PSI, we're seeing 41 PSI of, of back pressure. So for that exhaust housing, everything all in consideration, uh, that is actually pretty ideal for the moment. You could get a larger exhaust housing, but then um, mid-range suffers. Something you're going to notice up at the top here. Each time I was doing another pull, and you see this run is going along this area, you can see volumetric efficiency is slowly going to drop at the very last second up here. It's too rich. And that was starting to create this beautiful curve telling me that, yes, this engine is beginning to run out of breath. Of course, power says otherwise, but if you look at the fine details, you do see that the devil's in the details. Such a cool thing going on here. You see just such an insane amount of efficiency right here, right at the center. This isn't the engine running out of breath. We're trying to find where the engine is finally peaking 
at that power level. We never found it. It never hit that peak for that size of turbo and that size of engine. So I, I don't know where that is. Uh, we'll definitely need a hub dyno to get that answer, which means before and after is really our power band. Um, I did not want to go over 9,500 RPM uh, multiple times just because these rotors are stock. These rotors are not anything other than very finely balanced. I want to dedicate this dyno run to Valvoline. This stuff clearly works. It runs perfectly. We look up the amount of zinc, the amount of phosphorus, all of that inside of VR1. This is the first time we ran the synthetic version from the more traditional version. The traditional one's the one that you find at AutoZone and so on. This is the bee's knees. I just want to say a huge thank you to Valvoline because everything that is running, that is lubricated inside this drivetrain is all from Valvoline.